you already have a risk register. You take that risk register, you turn it into a quantitative risk register, and you get three, well, actually four valuable insights. I'll show you them in a second. Um, second level, you want to mitigate a specific risk. You need to do something about it. There is a There are a set of techniques that allow you to do that. And you need to deep dive into a specific risk to actually start getting you know, some insights into how to mitigate the risks. You can't mitigate risks at the level of risk register. That's not enough. You know, don't kid yourself. And uh, then there are problems where you can actually save a lot of money. And sometimes that requires a very specific tailor-made model. And again, you know, generators can do that. Uh, for for majority of the people, so I'm just reminded there are generators, you know, basically quants who know, like who have all the answers to the questions, like how do you quantify black swan events? It sounds like a scary question for somebody who's not a generator. For a generator, that's really easy. And uh, there are users, so the other 99% of the population, that uh, have maybe some basic understanding of the math behind risk management, but they don't really, they, they can't really build a model. So the users can stay at the basic level and maybe even move to the standardized level. These are two relatively simple stages. Advanced, of course, the last stage can only be done by generators. Again, don't kid yourself. Uh, it requires you know, sophisticated risk modeling uh, skills. For example, on Wednesday, I'm showing, no, on, th on Thursday. On Thursday, I'm doing a workshop where I will illustrate how we uh, build a calculator for quantifying risks to support our in, uh, insurance decisions and ended up saving you know, millions and millions of dollars. By the way, you know, real savings, not hypothetical, and uh, not subjective opinion, real hardcore cash savings. Last year it was this, this time, this year it was it is this, and we actually improved the quality of coverage, sometimes five times, sometimes two times, significantly improved the quality of coverage uh, without the sacrifices uh, in the actual quality of coverage. So first, basic. Um, you can take your risk register and turn it into a stochastic risk register by replacing your probabilities with distributions or frequencies and by replacing your uh, impacts with ranges of impacts and then simulating and then you can also correlate risks between one another in case they are related because uh, depending on whether risks are related or not related your overall exposure may be bigger or smaller and this is why correlation is so important and that gives you and you know if it's difficult to see full screen uh, full screen this there is a button on the uh, on the right bottom uh, of the screen where you you push it and you can full screen uh, full full screen the the video to view it so this is what a loss exceedance curve looks like and uh, the um, I think the, the 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 red one uh, is the unmitigated one, so you basically your current risk exposure, and then the yellow one is the one where you start thinking, okay, well the the red the the overall current risk exposure is unacceptable. We need to do something about it, and you add different um, mitigations to see how does the risk exposure uh, risk exposure changes. And uh, this loss exceedance curve, or this uh, I don't know, let's call it for simplicity, let's call it risk profile. This risk this risk profile has three super important pieces of information. All you've done is you um, quantified each of the risks. And by the way, when I said push of a button, there are software like Archer Insight that you can keep your risk register in, and then almost with the push of a button, you can convert your qualitative risk register into a quantitative, uh, quantitative risk register. Or there are templates available online where you can actually plug in, like you, you can copy paste your risk register into this template, and that template gives you the um, the kind of the first version of the of the loss curve. Uh, but then there are software packages like Archer that do this automatically for you, which is just amazing. And so three important pieces of information. And I'm I'm not gonna go all technical, uh, but these kind of these are the three things that even users, not, not just generators, generators know that that's like that's kindergarten stuff for them. Users need to understand. It's called expected losses. And that's basically your average risk exposure. Expected losses, or EL, again, we don't recreate the wheel. This is the terminology that the regulators used in banks for uh, market and credit risk forever. You know, this is very old stuff. We're just finally rediscovering it for non-financial non -financial companies. And uh, expected losses, or average, average risk exposure, is very important. Because what this means is that risks will happen throughout the year. 
There's no risk-free year. There's no risk-free project. Risks will happen. And understanding what the expected losses are is important for two reasons. Number one, you have to add expected losses to your budgeting. If you know you're going to lose this much money, you know, for example, you know, theft is a given in supermarkets. And that's why they just incorporate the cost of kind of the expected losses from theft into their budgeting process. So they don't, they're not surprised every year. And this is, this is part of the kind of risk culture where business have to appreciate that risk is a given and somebody has to pay for that risk. It's not just somewhere in the vacuum that happens and everybody's surprised. Risk is going to happen throughout the year. So expected losses is super important because you need to budget for it. And uh, second, uh, that gives you an indication on how much money is reasonable to spend on mitigations. Uh, I am doing a session with Brian Putt later this week where we actually deep dive into one specific, like one sample risk and we show how, um, uh, how um, we assess different effects of mitigations on the loss exceedance curve and how it changes the expected, expected losses. So two, two important pieces of information, uh, that you, two, two important uses of expected losses. You have to calculate expected losses and uh, that gives you the amount you need to budget and it gives you an indication on how much is too much for mitigation. Then it gives you the unexpected losses, which is your usually your VAR or 95th percentile, or it could be, you know, it could be expected shortfall, it could be conditional VAR, the metric itself is secondary, like a generator or somebody can help you figure out which metric is the best. But basically expected losses give you another important piece of information that you need to give to your treasury department. And when they aggregate different risks across the organization and trying to figure out, is the company financially liquid? Is it stable? Are they gonna have issues with liquidity? They are um, going to aggregate those unexpected losses uh, together and use that as an indication to see if there is any risk of breaking down the covenants. Um, Thank you, uh, Gabo, for joining the YouTube channel. Very much appreciate it. Um, so unexpected losses, another super valuable piece of information that your treasury department can benefit from right now. So all of this is not hypothetical. Expected losses you can use right now. Unexpected losses you can use right now. And then of course, Graham, also thank you for joining uh, the channel as a member. Um, unexpected losses is also something that you can use right now. And then of course, there is the final part of the distribution, so anything above 95th percentile or 99th percentile, whatever you kind of, whatever your uh, risk appetite is within the organization. For example, our organization had 97.5 because our credit rating was, our target credit, credit, credit rating was, um, um, I can't remember, BB minus or something and, or triple B and we wanted to uh, kind of match the risk appetite with the uh, target credit rating. And, and so the final bit of the distribution is called the tail. And this is basically all those catastrophic black swan event, events that are sitting on the tail of the risk uh, of the risk distribution. And that's where you give it to the insurance team, to the business continuity team, or to the treasury team who either hedge, create a BCM or BCP, or insure from the tail events. Um, Marcus is asking a very important question. He's asking, uh, are there instances where P50 median is better than the average expected loss? Um, because it kind of excludes the extreme tails. Uh, the one example where I've used P50 instead of uh, expected loss was all the environmental risks. Water pollution, air pollution, because it's super fat tail, super heavy tail, there's like a very small probability that your plant will be closed for 90 days and that's immediately millions of dollars lost. Uh, and um, our, our, our P50 was, no, sorry, no, our average was bigger than VAR, P95. Our average was bigger than P95 because the tail was just so ridiculously big. And so we ended up using uh, P50 in, in that. But most of the time you should be, unless it's a super fat tail distribution, you should be fine with uh, the average. So you've just pressed the button in Archer Insight or you converted your risk register manually into a quantitative risk register and you immediately get three super valuable pieces of information. But that's not all. The fourth valuable piece of information, you finally get the kind of the, the, the good heat map, the, the good prioritization. Uh, you can rank the risks based on the exposure or some other metric and um, um, prioritize them using a tornado diagram. And that, again, what, will, what you will find completely surprising is once you convert your risk register into a quantitative risk register, you'll be amazed that the um, priority in the quantitative risk register would be significantly different from the original priority you had on your heat map where um, you had you know five in, in red and three in yellow and so on. Uh, plus, 
the the other point uh, that is available there's there's this whole science around utility theory and uh, watch uh, Doug Hubbard's workshop later today he kind of talks a little bit about utility theory and gives some references uh, it's a very important utility theory because it allows you again you think not all risks can, can be quantified and you think well how do you deal with safety and environment and reputation these are all the things that have been dealt with and solved by scientists decades ago we're just not aware of that we like you know, all of this is new to us and we think oh this is an impossible problem to solve it is not an impossible problem to solve it's actually a very simple problem to solve because there's this whole utility theory which allows you to convert different risks into a single metric i don't know let's call them utis or utils and then you can run, rank risks based on utils and you can uh, prioritize risks based on utils so there are mathematical ways of dealing with all of these scary problems that um, most of the risk managers think they face you don't really need to you don't really face them because somebody already solved it you just need to find the person who solved it you know read the book or you know outsource that part of analysis to somebody to do it for you uh, or you know use a software that already built all of the uh, methodologies behind the behind the scenes and you can just apply it uh, or, or automatically.